the country with the largest uh, share of Muslims in our sample, something like 95, 96%, if not more, 95 according to those statistics. Well, the share of Christians with completed primary education who were born in the 50s is something like 46%, so roughly speaking, one out of two Christians had completed primary schooling just before independence. The corresponding ratio for Muslims is one out of five. Then you go, actually in this case, 40 years later, two out of three Christians now have completed primary schooling, but only one out of three, actually even a bit less of Muslims, which is the majority of Senegal's population, have completed primary school. So this paper effectively is digging into those issues. Now, there are various other ways to, to motivate uh, uh, this paper. So you could think about, uh, you know, religious fundamentalism that seems to be on the rise in Africa, but also uh, globally, this is clearly not an African uh, phenomenon. But the way we, we want to think about this project, uh, and correct us if we're wrong, is that Christianity has been one of the biggest experiments, social experiments uh, in Africa in the past century. Uh, of course, it is associated with the brutality uh, of, uh, of the colonial experience. But then Islam, which actually uh, had its origins in the continent uh, before perhaps uh, Christianity, is the fastest growing religious group uh, in Africa. And according to the Pew Forum projections, by 2050, Africa will be hosting very large, perhaps the largest in the world, Christian and Muslim communities. So an obvious question, uh, which surprisingly has not received much attention by economists, is are we expecting, you know, a, like a peaceful coincidence or we should expect uh, more animosity? And we believe that education is one margin that should be of primary importance to the people of Africa, to the societies, to policy makers, to international institutions. So what we will try to do in this paper is we'll try to do five things. First, we will give you new statistics reflecting the intergenerational transmission of education in the same household across religious lines. So we will provide the new statistics of upward and downward in the generational mobility for 20 countries and more than 2,000 African regions. Our measures of absolute intergenerational mobility will reflect the likelihood that kids whose parents have not completed primary schooling, manage to complete primary schooling or higher. Reversely, downward absolute mobility is defined as the likelihood that boys and girls whose parents have completed primary schooling actually fail to complete primary school, so it, they go down. So after documenting and presenting those new statistics uh, across countries, we will go at the individual level and we will try to explore which features explain the considerable differences in both upward and downward mobility that our descriptive analysis will reveal. We will distinguish between three broad sets of factors of potential explanations, one related to family and households, so think about polygamy, endogamy, household size, co-residence with grandparents, then we would think more about economic features related to industry and profession of employment, rural urban status. And then we will think more about regions uh, and we'll see whether regions explain partly at least uh, the documented large differences across religious affiliation on intergenerational mobility and education. To preamble the results, our analysis will show that economic trades do not matter at all. They cannot explain differences in educational mobility. And the reason is actually quite simple. Christian and Muslim households do not much differ on the industry of employment, their profession, their ruralness, or their, how likely they are to reside in urban places. They will explain a part of the Christian animist gap because animist households will be much more likely to work in agriculture and to be much more rural. Family and household features that there is a very vibrant research, mostly in policy science and cultural anthropology, and increasingly so in economics, 
will explain just a bit uh, of the differences uh, between Christians and Muslims or between Christians and animists in education. Model. Regional features that okay. relate to segregation will explain roughly speaking half of the considerable differences in intergenerational mobility between Christians and Muslims. So then, if you like, the decomposition that we do in part two begets or opens two questions. First, since regions matter, do they matter causally? Or is simply the fact that Christians, quote unquote, short better, so they tend to locate and migrate in places with more opportunity vis-a-vis -vis animists and Christians. We will employ a very neat uh, technique developed by Raj Chetty and Nathaniel Hendren that will explore uh, differences in the place of residence during the critical for primary school years 0 to 12, 13, of kids who, whose parents moved when they were at different ages. The analysis will show that actually both Muslims and Christians gain from a good environment, from residing in an area with high levels of mobility. So the causal effect of regions, if anything, is somewhat higher for Muslims. Now, this technique will tell us that regions matter, but they will not tell us which regional features matter. So then we will employ a correlational analysis. So we'll set aside the issue of causation that we tackled in section three and we will explore which features tend to correlate with high levels of mobility. Drawing a bit on our companion uh, paper, we will find that residing close to the capitals, close to the coastline, in places with good climatic and soil conditions for agriculture, tends to make kids whose parents have not completed primary schooling have a much higher propensity to complete primary schooling, so upward mobility will be higher, but we will not find any differential in the strength of the correlation between Christians, animists, and Muslims. In other words, and although these are, do not necessarily have a causal interpretation, they will suggest that both Christians and Muslims and animists, if they happen to be in a good area, they benefit. In other words, they will not explain the gap. So the question that baffled us for quite a long time is what matters that? Which regional feature matters? So in the last part, uh, or in the almost last part of, of, of my presentation, we will show you some results that the single most important correlate of the religious intergenerational mobility gap is the share of Muslims in the district that adversely correlates or negatively correlates with how well Muslims perform in terms of mobility. Or in other words, does it Elias. two Muslims, one that resides in an area with many other Muslims, and a Muslim who resides in an area where there are some uh, animals, El perhaps, and so Elias. Please, Manuel. Yes. Does it matter uh, that all colonial powers were Europeans and therefore Christians at all? Would they be, would the colonial power, for instance, be more interested in investing in education uh, of, of those non Muslims, for instance? Well, that, that's a great uh, point, Manuel. And if I was to go back, I'll show you some results on this shortly. What you just mentioned, I think, does explain, and there is interesting work on that, on the level differences of independence. So let me just uh, pick Ghana as another example. 60% of Christians at Ghana's independence, if I'm not mistaken, in, 50, in 57. So two out of three Christians had completed primary schooling. Only one out of five Muslims had completed primary school. Clearly, as you rightly point out, I think, part of the explanation is that the Christian missions and the schools that were built uh, in Ghana were mostly in the southern areas, in the Asante and the Gold Coast areas uh, and close to Accra, where mostly the colonialists settled. So I think this is clearly part of the story. And uh, uh, Jedwab, uh, Moradi, and Felix have an interesting paper on that. However, if you were to go, you know, 40 years afterwards and explore differences in Ghana, actually Ghana is a case where actually Muslims have 
have been doing relatively well. The share of completed primary has almost doubled. So actually Ghana is, is a case where the gap has closed. But in other parts of the continent, Cameroon is another very good example, actually differences have remained larger, they have even increased. So our point is that it must be also something on top of colonization. Perhaps colonization set the seeds for those differences, but in the post-independence period, you know, those differences stayed. And you know, I don't want to push this too much, but you know, the example of Ethiopia, where well, it was quote unquote never a colony, I know. I, we can debate this endlessly, again, shows considerable differences. Also, the case of uh, Liberia shows considerable differences. Again, uh, I do not necessarily subscribe that those were not colonies, but because they were affected by the colonial uh, 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 regime. But again, this is mostly a story about post-independence rather than a story about what happened colonization. And on your question more succinctly, we do not have, you know, uh, I guess, contemporary African countries that were quote unquote colonized by some uh, Muslim uh, uh, force, uh, uh, I presume. I mean, if you can make the point about Egypt, Egypt is another case where, you know, actually Muslims have done quite well post independence. So, again, this. We have like a broader research agenda with uh, Alberto and Sebastian and Stelios on trying to understand a bit better the dynamics of education uh, post-independence uh, in Africa. We have some companion work looking across ethnicities. Uh, we have a companion paper that will really shortly look in Mozambique next door and exploring the role of the civil war uh, and the forced displacement that took place when Renamo and Frelimo were fighting. But sticking to, 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 our, to our current war, this paper, and I want to be as sincere as possible here, I actually, believe it or not, is, is came out of original research. So when we started working with the data and we had like uh, our other papers, we just realized that religion was like so important and so salient. And although there is work, as I mentioned, on education in Africa, with the exception of a, an interesting paper by Melina Platas, uh, uh, there's not much work on uh, exploring the role of religion uh, uh, or in education in Africa. And the works on Islam and economic uh, performance, for example, uh, Timur Koran has, uh, has, uh, has a gel piece on that. There are few works on Africa. Mostly those studies focus on the Middle East, in a couple in Indonesia, for example, there's quite exciting uh, 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 work uh, by Badzi and co-authors. There's not much. There's a lot of research in Polish science and history, but not so much in economics with formal econometric techniques and perhaps with formal theory. Now, we will employ an intergenerational uh, mobility perspective, and therefore our paper will connect to a very vibrant uh, research agenda that has been revitalized by the work uh, of Chetty, Hendren, and the Moving to Opportunity team, uh, currently based uh, at Harvard. We will not look on income, we lack data on income, uh, and uh, education in any case is a very interesting concept. Both uh, it has some nice uh, uh, empirical features, like less measurement error as compared to income. And secondly, in the core models that we use about intergenerational transmission, education and human capital investments that parents and households make for their kids feature prominently in the classic a way thinking about mobility, for example, in the paper of uh, Baker and Toms or Glenn Lowry's important work. There are some papers uh, floating around, of course, on intergenerational mobility in education. Those works have not looked at the role of religion, uh, an exception being here the work uh, by Asher, Novosad, and Rafkin, in a very neat paper uh, looking on India and exploiting at the same time differences across regions, castes, and religious affiliation. So of most relevance are going to be some papers in the US that look on race. We will not look on race, we'll focus uh, on religion, but our paper will have, if you like, conceptual similarities with the important early work of uh, Borges on ethnic capital, in our case, it's going to be religious capital, and the work of uh, uh, Raj et al, uh, recently published at the QG, uh, where they 
try to explain why we observe the sizable gap in income intergenerational mobility between uh, African Americans uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Caucasian whites in the US. So let me, uh, Manuel, how much time do I have? Uh, you have another 20 minutes. Then another can, 20 then, minutes. Then, yeah, then we can open up for questions. Sure. Okay, so let me just uh, go a bit uh, uh, quicker. So we will be using data from IPUMS. Uh, this is an international project that collects census data from many uh, African countries. Not all countries report data on religion. Let me not go much into the detail. We will be focusing on 20 countries and we will focus on 38 censuses. Everything I will show you will be based on weighted regression. Waiting is needed for a very simple reason. Nigeria, which is the biggest in terms of population country, has the smallest coverage in IPUMS. Ethiopia also has small uh, coverage. So we are waiting observations to reflect uh, the real, if you like, the actual differences between Christians and Muslims and animists in the country. We will use, but I have defined those measures, an index of absolute intergenerational mobility that will reflect the likelihood that children of parents with less than primary education that we coin illiterate will complete at least primary school in what we call literate. So higher upward mobility, think about it as a good thing at the household level. Reversely, downward mobility will be defined as the likelihood that children of parents with at least primary education fail to complete primary school. Elias, uh, that is a question. Um... Coming from Eleni, uh, do you observe everyone's paternal background or are you looking at children who co-reside with their parents? Okay, so Eleni, you have the name of my mother, so it's, uh, uh, thanks for the question. Now, this slide is trying to, to get uh, into that. The answer is no, we do not always observe biological father or mother. Eleni, let's discuss more about that uh, in our companion paper. If you go to our website, we have a very long appendix where we go into the details of that. In the end, it would not matter. Uh, but we have, so when I say parents, I would also define older generation, including perhaps aunts and uncles. For robustness, we have done everything only looking at biological father and mother. The results actually are very simple. So an issue that we are faced and overall the literature on mobility faces is that it is very hard to trace children when they leave the parental house. So of course here we are quote unquote fortunate in the sense that the relevant margin for education in Africa during our sample period is the completed primary. And therefore what we are going to do is going to look at individuals aged 14 to 18 where coresidence rates are very high. And this will allow us to carefully uh, uh, look at the likelihood that children have completed primary schooling vis-a-vis -vis that of their parents. And by looking at individuals 14 to 18 years old, we allow for some time for kids to complete primary schooling. Uh, and in this, we follow the work uh, of David Card and Cotha, where they have some a similar kind of application in the US using the 1940 census. So an issue that we may face is the level of coresidence, which actually this, this graph shows that coresidence rates between Christians, Muslims, and animists are roughly speaking comparable, both at the country and actually also uh, at the district level. We account for time and cohort effects, and actually, Manuel, going to your question, effectively, you should think about downward and upward, downward and upward mobility as decomposing changes at the group level, so Christians, animists, and, and Muslims over time. So you can think about the changes in completed primary as having a component that reflects upward mobility and a component that reflects downward mobility. So these are the newly compiled statistics. So these statistics reflect upward mobility for Christian, Muslims, and animists in those 20 countries and correspondingly this is 
the statistics for downward mobility. Let me pick one example. For example, this could be Cameroon. The likelihood that the, a boy or a girl born in a Christian household whose parents, including uncles and aunts, have not completed primary schooling, and he or she completes primary schooling something like three out of four, so relatively high. For Muslims, it is less than one out of two. Actually, for Muslims, even lower as compared to Animes. We have 113 districts in Cameroon. In 86% of those, Christians are doing better than, uh, than Muslims. So, of course, these statistics in the paper, we report also by urban and rural status, and we report differently for boys and girls. Now, a first question, but for brevity, let me not uh, discuss in detail, is what correlates at the country level with intergenerational mobility across religious affiliation. Of course, these are correlations estimated with 20 points, so uh, you should uh, interpret them uh, uh, very cautiously. But for example, if I was to use GDP per capita in 1965, what this tells me is that all religions groups Christians, Muslims, and animists do better in terms of upward mobility in relatively richer places. But the strength of the correlation between GDP and upward mobility is similar for the three groups. As a consequence, GDP per capita is orthogonal, does not correlate at all with a gap between Christians and Muslims or between Christians and animists in this case uh, across the country. So let me now discuss the first, if you like, set of decomposition analysis results. So what can explain educational mobility across religious affiliation? Well, we will run very simple regressions. And well, we will have the intergenerational mobility of individual I, of birth cohort B, in country C, in household H, in district D, as recorded in the census that took place in year T we will always include country birth fixed effects. And then we will focus on the coefficient on the Muslim indicator and the animist indicator that will reflect the gap vis-a-vis -vis the Christians, which is the omitted or the baseline category. And we will examine what is the role of household features, income proxies, and district fixed effects. These are, if you like, the variables uh, that we consider. There are differences on household size, for example, between Christians and Muslims and between Christians and animists. This is what these bars indicate when we do not control for anything. On an average household of Muslims is by one person larger vis-a-vis -vis Christian. Right. And let me just for the brevity of time not uh, go into the detail. These are, these are the results. So there are differences in household structure in relationship to household head, in, the gen in how early the previous generation uh, uh, got married or, 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 or was born. Differences between Christians and Muslims on rural urban status are not simply put not here. Traditionalists are less likely to reside in urban places and more likely to be classified by the census as being rural households. So there are some differences. But again, between Christians and Muslims, the two big groups, actually there are very small differences in the industry of employment or occupation. So this are, if you like, is the summary of this preliminary analysis. So this is the first, if you like, results or new result, new findings kind of table that shows you the following. The baseline is that animists have a 20 percentage points lower likelihood to complete primary education when their parents have not completed primary education. The corresponding gap between Christians and Muslims, again, I'm comparing boys and girls whose parents have not completed primary education, is something like 17 percentage points. So they are large. When we include household or family characteristics, there is some drop in those gaps, but those gaps are actually relatively small in the range of 10 percent. Once we control for occupation, specialization, rural urban status, if anything, you know, those gaps become more precise and somewhat larger. And we get very similar picture 
actually when we look on downward mobility, the interesting result here is that downward mobility is higher for Muslims as compared to animals. So something happens and the boys and girls of Muslim parents with completed primary schooling do not complete primary schooling, although their parents, broadly defined going to Elaine's earlier remark, have completed primary school. What tends to matter? Well, as you can see here in the case of downward mobility, actually the district fixed effects is what really matters. So segregation, going back to my earlier upward mobility graph, tends to explain something like half of the considerable gaps in both upward and downward mobility between Christians and Muslims and between Christians and animals. We can do this by boys, girls. The interesting result here is that household and family characteristics, if anything, they matter a bit more, a bit more for girls vis-a-vis -vis boys. So this, if you like, is the summary of the results. So takeaway results, economic features do not much matter. Household and family characteristics matter just a bit. Regional characteristics matter the most. They explain on average something like half of the variation on the IM gap between Christians and Muslims, and between uh, Christians and animists. And they matter more in countries in the Sahel, in Nigeria, in Benin, in Ghana, in Cameroon, in Senegal. Those are countries, by the way, that tend to have high levels of religious segregation, as documented in some earlier work of Alberto mm -hmm. Alezina with uh, Katia Zorowska here at the AI. So, you know, going back to Eleni's point, you know, looking only at biological children or expanding the sample to increase, uh, actually, in this case, the sample doubles, but with lower cohabitation rates, yields very similar uh, kind uh, of, of results. Now, Given those differences and the fact that regions matter, there are two, I think, natural or we think natural questions. The fact, the first is, do regions have a causal effect? Second, which regional features matter? So let me start with the former. We will use this methodology of Chetty and Hedren, which effectively will look on kids whose families moved when they were in different ages that matter for primary. Uh, uh, for primary school. Now, to go quickly over the technicalities, although I understand that there is the time constraint, this approach will do the following. It will define first a measure reflecting the gap in intergenerational mobility for simplicity, let's say upward mobility. So uh, a positive gap would mean that kids are leaving a place with relatively low mobility and go to a place with relatively high mobility. There are two vintages of this statistic of how good regions are. One that takes into account all non-movers, Christians, animists, and Muslims. And one where I match Christians to Christians in origin and destination, I match Muslims to Muslims in origin and destination. I match animists to animists in origin and destination. So this would be the summary statistic that reflects how good regions are in taking people uh, from family backgrounds without much education into completing primary school. So then we will estimate the semi-parametric specification that effectively for each age of move, M, we will get a different slope conditioning on birth cohort fixed effects, on general age fixed effects, and we can even do this with household fixed effects. So to exploit variation between brothers and sisters or within sisters or across brothers that they move when the kids move in different, uh, 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 at different ages. Manuel, Elias, question? Yes, Eleni has another question. Uh, will the results hold if you use intergenerational elasticity slash correlation to measure uh, IM? If no, uh, if not, why? Okay, uh, can I postpone this question uh, for after I'm done? Of course you can. Thank you. Actually, that's a very good question. Let, let me come back to it. Uh, 
So the analysis I will show you will have will be based on 14 countries out of the 20 because it is only for those 14 countries that census has information of where people were born and where people uh, moved uh, subsequently. And for this kind of methodology, we really need to explore in the time of children's birth. In our companion paper, we do many checks of the validity of this identification design that in this paper we take as granted. I can show you perhaps some household fixed effect specification, but we take as granted this technique. So these are the results. So let me, for example, start with Muslims. So what do those statistics tell me? Take a Muslim kid that moved when his, that, that his parents moved when he was just one year old. And compare this, let's say, girl with another Muslim girl that moved from the same district and those two girls are born in the same decade, but her parents moved when she was, let's say, 10 years old. The likelihood that the former girl will complete primary schooling is something like 65 percentage points, while for the second uh, uh, female in my example is something like 40. So there is a 25 percentage points gap suggesting that the earlier the move, the higher the likelihood that this Muslim boy and girl will complete primary school. Now, the second interesting result from this graph is that even moves after the age of 12 or 13 or whatever is your favorite uh, cutoff here, it could be 15, even moves after the age, let's say of 12, 13, where primary school gets completed, even those moves tend to be associated with a higher likelihood of moving. So the, in other words, the vertical axis is not crossing zero, it's actually positive, which effectively shows or reveals quote unquote selection effects. Yet those households who move, and recall, these are households where the parents have not completed primary schooling, their offsprings do get higher schooling by something like 35 percentage points. So this is evidence of special shorting or selection effects to use the Chetty Hendrick terminology. Now, the interesting thing here when you compare Christians to Muslims, actually there are two results. The most important, at least for us, is that when Muslims, boys and girls, do move from a low mobility to a high mobility place, they do gain from this move. And if you trust the estimates, although obviously there is some noise here, you know, those regional exposure effects, if anything, are larger for Muslims as compared to Christians. The second interesting result is that selection tends to be somewhat higher for Muslims as compared to Christians, which it's another word to say that those Muslims who move, their kids are way more likely to complete primary schooling vis-a-vis those Christians that move. Now, there are various ways, you know, one could do various tests here. Uh, let me refer you to our appendix and our companion paper in Econometrica. Effectively, the result here is that there is some interesting asymmetry with girls benefiting more from moves to good places and girls losing the most when their parents move from a high mobility to a low mobility place. So this is the result for girls. This is the result for boys. Actually, what you see here is that, if anything, Muslim girls, so if I was to think about the matrix, Christian boys, Christian girls, Muslim boys, Muslim girls, Muslim girls are the ones who are the most sensitive to moves. On the positive side, when the move is from a low mobility to a high mobility place, and reversely, from a high mobility place to a low mobility place is when they lose them. So two takeaways, significant regional childhood exposure effects for all religions. I didn't show you for brevity the results with animists just because the sample is actually quite small. 
sizable spatial shorting, both for Christians and Muslims. So this is a very big difference vis-a-vis -vis the US where Chetty and Henry document spatial shorting, but of much smaller magnitude vis-a-vis -vis what we find. And actually spatial shorting seems to be high, the highest for animists, next for Muslims, the lowest for Christians. So I have 12 more minutes, Manuel, correct? Uh, yeah, you, you can, let's say, let's, let's make it 15. Okay. Because no, the whole no, thing no. is so interesting and uh, there are a number of questions. So let's make it 15, sure. 20 minutes. Uh, we, yeah. we all want to see you finishing the paper. Okay, and thank you, is, thank you very uh, much and apologies for being No problem, no problem at all. And there is a question from uh, Simon Kelly. Simon Kelly, can you please un unmute yourself and ask your question? No, okay, no. Um, hi, Elias, can you hear me? Yes, of course, thank you. Okay, thank you. Very interesting paper. I enjoyed it. I'm enjoying it. Um, I have kind of three questions. I'll get through them very quickly. Uh, the first is, there's kind of like a big transition in many countries from traditional animist religions into either Christianity or Islam. And that happens from like the 50s. I mean, if you look at it in the 50s, Nigeria doesn't look very Christian or Muslim. But now it's either Christian or Muslim. So I'm wondering, it does a kind of sorting in the sense that some places see uh, how groups are doing and decide to sort into that. Uh, I'm thinking of this in the context of reverse causality, for example, where maybe regions see that some Christian areas are doing, which are more as affiliated with colonial regimes are doing relatively better than others. Uh, there's a region in Nigeria, the north, kind of southern northeast that has become very educated relatively and also become relatively more Christian in the last 20, 30 years or so. So I'm wondering that's something to look at. Um, the second question, I'm wondering if, I mean, besides moving to a more diverse area being positive, I'm wondering if there's some role for kind of national competition in terms of having uh, kind of very homogeneous areas within a country competing for what types of investments to make in education. And again, I'm thinking of the Nigerian context where you have national diversity, yes, but also very kind of homogeneous regions where they have to decide what type of educational investments to make. And you see big differences. I'm wondering if that matters. Uh, and of course, you know, with anything census related, I have to ask about the quality of census data. And again, thinking about Nigeria, the quality is suspicious. So I'm wondering if uh, it's possible to use kind of alternative data sources, maybe like the Afrobarometer, just to see uh, how credible the data are. Thank you. Thank you, Nonso. Thank you very much. So your, all your questions are spot on. Now, on religious competition, I, I, perhaps you have a good idea. We don't have a very good idea how exactly to test it. We examined whether the kids have different religion than their parents. And I, if, if I'm not mistaken, it was like more than 99%. Because those, of course, are kids like 14 to 18 years old, right? So if they are to change, they haven't changed yet. So this is something that, let me be sincere here, we're not a, a much tackling. Now, on, the, on your second question, actually, let, let me, let's discuss it when I show you those results. And I really look forward to your input. Perhaps what you say about districts competing could be part of the story. We have tabulated, so this part, I don't know whether I will reach it, further evidence does have some results with a probarometer. Perhaps we can do more on that. But let me get back to you shortly on that. So the, the, the last part, if you like, will have some additional auxiliary results. It's okay, regions matter, but which regional characteristics matter? So effectively, what we will do in this part of the paper is, fair, is first I will give you some maps of religious IM gaps across those 20 countries in my sample. And secondly, I will show you actually something that I guess you already know that 
there are differences uh, on residence between Christians and Muslims and between Christians and animists. Then I will examine the correlates of mobility and the correlates of, of IMK. Again, the objective here is not to say something causal. For example, I think uh, Nonso has a good paper on Nigeria about Christian missions and railroads uh, you know, in a causal way. So this is not going to be a causal analysis. But we think about this characterizing, if you like, the geography or the spatial distribution of religious differences in education and mobility. So this is our mapping of the Christian Muslim and the Christian animist gap across countries. Yes, so this is, so I managed to put that. So this is the Christian traditionalist gap and the Christian Muslim gap in Ghana. So I'm just zooming in one country here. So these are the correlates that we will examine. I'm sure you have more to add. This is, we take it from our companion paper. And as preliminary evidence, we examine whether Christians, whether Muslims and animists reside in areas with different regional characteristics vis-a-vis -vis Christians, which is the omitted category here. So for example, what you can see here, so these are at independence economic features, that Christians and Muslims tend to reside in less densely populated areas, somewhat less urbanized, more specializing in agriculture as compared to manufacturing and service. Animists and uh, Muslims to a lesser extent tend to reside in areas further away from the capital, further away from the coast, and further away from colonial railroads and roads that have persisted. So in a nutshell, Muslims reside, quote unquote, in less developed regions. And animists, if anything, reside in even less developed and even more remote from the capital and the coast region. So now with this background, which I don't think it was needed perhaps in this cloud, uh, is we will simply regress the intergenerational mobility of individual I in country C for religious group G, as recorded in census taking place in period T of birth cohort P and of religious uh, uh, affiliation R on a bunch of fixed effects. And all of the features I showed you before, I will just show you plain vanilla uh, fixed effect correlations. That, let me just show you the at independence features. So what these results show which are actually very consistent with our companion paper, is that mobile, upward mobility is higher and downward mobility is low in richer and more developed places. So perhaps this is not very surprising. What we add here vis-a-vis -vis our companion work is that those correlations in, to a first approximation are homogeneous. Yeah, Muslims and Christians and animists, quote unquote, benefit, although this is just a correlation from being in more densely populated areas with more specialization in manufacturing and services. Which effectively tells you that if my dependent variable now is not the different I am of Christians, Muslims, and animists, but it is the gap between Christian I am and Muslim I am, or between Christian I am and animist I am, nothing seems to be significant. So wide standard errors and relatively small correlations. In other words, you know, what this tells you is the following. There are some good regions, as I showed you in my earlier section, that causally matter. Those regional characteristics that matter for mobility are distance to the coast, distance to the capital, urbanization, and early process of independence, early meaning at independence. So going back to Manuel's point, what happened during colonization does matter. But it matters equally for Christians, Muslims, and others. And hence, it does not explain the gap in educational mobility across religious affiliation. 
Recall, though, that Muslim synonymists, to start with, they reside, quote unquote, in wars areas, so in areas with wars mobility. But in my decomposition section, I showed you that regional features matter. So the question is, you know, which features matter in explaining the gap? So then we motiv actually motivated by our descriptive evidence, uh, you know, Ed Glacier and some others told us to go a bit and explore the research on ghettos in the US. Uh, and there's a lot of research actually on ghettos uh, and the performance of African-Americans vis-a-vis whites and Latinos in ghettos vis-a-vis -vis non-segregated communities. So effectively, we tried, and again, this was in a very research uh, <laughs> fashion, we tried to run some very similar to that literature specification, which effectively are specifications like what I show, I'm showing you here. So let me start with the unconditional specification. So here, the dependent variable is upward intergenerational mobility on your left and downward in the generation of mobility on your right. Separately for Christians, Muslims, and others. I will show you shortly the results with the gap, but you can already see the gap here. So what the unconditional specifications are telling me is that Christians do well in places where there are many other Christians. Muslims, and to a lesser extent, animists do badly in places where there are many Christians, sorry, when there are many Muslims and many animists. And something like a mirror image when I look on down. However, you may say, wait a minute. Christians live in better areas, quote unquote, in more developed areas. So let's control for the share of literacy of the old generation without distinguishing whether the old generation is a Christian, Muslim, or Amish. This is what I'm doing in, in specification three. So think about this as a summary statistic of how developed the region is. So what do we now find? Well, effectively, the coefficient for Christians for upward mobility is zero. It even flips sign. In the case for animists, this, the sample is way smaller for animists to recall. You know, again, I'm getting a coefficient that flips on. But for Muslims, the coefficient still remains negative and actually quite economically significant. That suggests even if you control for the literacy of the old generation, of the overall old generation, Muslims underperform in places where there are many. And this is clearly not the case for Christians. You can control, quote unquote, better for religious capital. I'm using here the terminology of Borges. Again, actually, for animists, you get precisely estimated zero correlations. For Christians, you get either a no correlation or a somewhat positive correlation. But for Muslims, still, you get this result that Muslims do badly in places where there are significant Muslim communities. Yeah, the share of Muslims is actually quite large. So you can run, of course, those regressions with the religious gap as the outcome variable, rather than doing it religion by religion. This is what you get for Christians. This is what you get for Muslims. In other words, Muslim, sorry, Christians do quote unquote equally well. Recall they have a higher level of upward mobility. In this sense, they do better. Both in places where there are not many. So by definition, these are places where many animists and mostly Muslims reside and in places where there are many. Going now to Muslims, actually they do well. So this is not zero because everything here is demeaned. They do relatively better as compared to other Muslims in places where there are not that many or there are modest communities. And actually they do badly, these are negative and highly significant coefficients in places where the population is mostly Muslim. So, this is, if you like, you know, the somewhat paradoxical result. Uh, actually, in the version of the paper that I have released, uh, it seems like a paradox. We have uh, actually read quite a lot about uh, research looking on ghettos and racial differences in the US. Interestingly, they tend to find something similar in the sense that African-Americans tend to underperform in places where there are many under-Americans. Of course, it's not causal by no means, 
and there is now a very vibrant research in the US trying to short out uh, causation from spatial shorting, which is considerable in this application. But there's a very interesting analogy uh, that I want to stress. Here. So effectively to conclude, or if you like to give you some more evidence, uh, we were baffled by this result. So effectively what we try to do, and they are in the paper, although we are debating now uh, whether we should include them or not. Well, we have some evidence that try a bit to dig in this, uh, in this issue. So in a nutshell, let me just, I'm sure that you have played a lot with, uh, with Afrobarometer. There is one question that you can see the question here that effectively is a question about preferences for residing close to other people from your own religious community. And the evidence that are summarized here is effectively that Muslims have a strong preference to reside in neighborhoods where other Muslims are around. So this suggests that, you know, perhaps they gain some value out of it. And, you know, this could, is consistent, it's not an explanation, but it is consistent with our pattern. Recall also that Muslims are also uh, the group where selection is higher, which is just that those people who move, quote unquote, their offsprings do better in absolute terms. So there are also some other questions like the ones you hear, how important it is education, although how important it is for the community to get government support on education. So these are like some questions that we are working with. Another interesting uh, aspect that uh, we're not sure whether it belongs to this paper or not, but it's summarized here. So these are very simple, plain vanilla descriptive statistics on out migration uh, across religious affiliation. And the flagship result here is that it seems to be considerably higher when we wait uh, is more than double when we do not wait is something like double for Christians vis-a-vis -vis Muslims. And what we believe is actually quite interesting is there is, let me just mention this very interesting work. There is very interesting work on internal migration summarized by David Lagakos in a, in a very recent Journal of Economic Perspective piece. And very interesting work, uh, you can see some papers here, uh, showing that there are no negligible, unrealized gains from internal migration, which perhaps, there is a perhaps here that future research should try to dig, should try to see whether they could explain part of these regularities. Clearly as raw, plain vanilla uh, uh, statistics, you can see, you can also see my daughter now behind who is playing, uh, but you see that there is much higher level of internal migration for Christians vis-a-vis -vis Muslims and others. And effectively, there are Okay, um, can you guys hear me? Yes, Manuel, we can hear you. Okay, Elias seems to be, um, we, we know infrastructure in the UK is really is bad now and we are here down here complaining about load shedding. Um, so let's see, let's give a couple of minutes to see if he comes back um, because, uh, because it would be nice to, to who have okay he, he he's gone completely so let's wait a couple a couple of minutes uh, to see if he's able to to come back uh, 